Welcome to Fast Keto. I'm your host, Ketogenic Girl. Did you know that your body can actually be either a sugar burner or a fat burner? On this podcast, we talk all about how to make your body a fat-burning, fat-fueled machine and engaging your full metabolic flexibility. I'm Vanessa Spina. I am a sport nutrition specialist a biomedical science student at U of T, and I am the author of the best-selling cookbook, Keto Essentials, available on Amazon and creator of the Ketogenic Girl Challenge Program. And I am obsessed with optimizing our health through all these different biohacks, ketogenesis, intermittent fasting, all of these amazing tools that center around making the body a fat-adapted, fat-fueled machine. With this in mind, I present interviews to you with biomedical scientists, physicians, and people from all around the world who have experienced remarkable results from following a low-carb or ketogenic diet and getting their body into ketogenesis. So I hope you guys enjoy these interviews with this goal in mind. Welcome back to Fast Keto, friends. I'm so excited to do this solo cast episode with you guys. I just love doing these episodes with you because... I know that I'm getting to keep you, my friends, company while you're doing things where you're going for a walk or you're doing some errands or some housework or you're cooking. You know, that's when I listen to podcasts. They keep me company and, you know, I love all you guys so much and I just love all the feedback that you guys give me on the episodes and how much you enjoy them. And I really have to say I've been really touched by how much you guys have been giving me feedback on these solo episodes. I really started doing them this year in addition to having the Monday episode with a guest. And I just really love the time that I get to take, you know, to like synthesize information that I'm reading or studying for upcoming guests and just give you guys my thoughts on different research and things. So today's episode is going to be about a couple of studies and some conclusions that I drew from reading them. I shared them at Ketogenic Girl on Instagram. If you don't already follow me there, go and check it out because I post a lot of what I eat in a day, my meals, and I post studies that I find interesting. So I wanted to share a couple of them on this episode. So hope you guys enjoy it and uh, hope I can keep you company, whatever it is that you're doing on your commute, whether you're just chilling out or you're on your way somewhere. Hope that you can sit back and enjoy this episode. This episode is made possible by one of my favorite companies, ButcherBox. I absolutely love this company. The difference in the quality of their meat when compared to the grocery store, the convenience of having delivery shipped right to your door, and how budget-friendly it is makes it one of my favorite services out there. Now, some of the things I love about them is they have delicious 100% grass-fed beef. So that means you're getting beef with the healthiest omega-3 to omega-6 profile. You are getting free-range organic chicken, heritage breed pork, and wild caught seafood. It's really unbeatable value because the average cost works out to less than $6 per meal. I love how flexible it is. They have so many different box options and delivery frequencies to fit your needs and you can cancel anytime with no penalties. It's so convenient because you get great tasting meat that you can feel really good about delivered right to your door with free shipping. I really think caring about animals in our planet Improving the livelihoods for farmers and having better meals enjoyed together makes such a difference. ButcherBox sources from ranchers and fishers who meet the highest standards for quality. You get to choose your box and your delivery frequency. They offer five different boxes, four curated box options, as well as their popular custom box, so you can get exactly what you and your family love. They ship your order frozen for freshness and packed in an eco-friendly, 100% recyclable box. So you get to enjoy high quality meat delivered quickly to your door. And this saves you time. So you have more time for yourself, more time to have amazing meals together as a family. Now, the wait is over. ButcherBox is now welcoming new customers again. You can sign up today at butcherbox.com slash fast keto. That's F-A-S-T. K-E-T-O to get high quality meat delivered directly to your door. That's butcherbox.com slash fast keto. Try them out and let me know how much you love it. 
All right, guys. So there's a couple studies I wanted to go over and just talk about some of the conclusions for them. So the first one was about the impact of the menstrual cycle on our metabolism. And you may have heard that, you know, the metabolism is boosted during our PMS week, but there is actually solid science behind this. And there's quite a few studies that I found on this. One of them was in a review and it talked about the, basically the menstrual cycle and specifically the luteal phase, which is the PMS week. So like usually seven to six to eight days leading up to right before your period starts. And if you're a male listening to this, don't worry. The other study I'm going to talk about has nothing to do with cycles, but it may be interesting for you to know more about that. Maybe some of the women in your life that you care about and you can pass this information onto them because it's really useful to know. A lot of us women get a lot of cravings in our PMS week. And I know I always used to feel weak during that time. I would crave more food. I would have cravings for for things. My appetite would be higher. And I just felt weak. Like, oh, I just want, you know, chocolate because I'm, you know, in a sad mood or I'm feeling PMS-y. But it's actually because our body is demanding more energy. And Research actually identified that we get a basal metabolic rate, BMR boost, and a sleeping metabolic SMR boost in the range of anywhere from 89 to 279 calories per day. So a lot of articles on the internet will say you burn about 300 calories a day. It's somewhere in the range of 89 to 279 or to round it out, 100 to 300 calories in a day. And those studies also showed that there was no fat gain during that time, despite these study participants eating a higher calorie intake because of having these demands for more food. So having that higher appetite during that luteal phase, right before you get your period is totally normal. It's because your body needs more energy, it needs more calories, and you can indulge in that extra 100 to 300 without feeling bad about it because there is no fat gain. Your body just needs more calories. It needs more energy, and it's just all a part of what our bodies are going through physiologically during that premenstrual week. So it's really cool to know that there is solid science and research behind this, and You don't have to feel bad about having those cravings. There's completely a reason behind it. And, you know, women's bodies really do a lot. We really go through quite a bit in our monthly cycle and the body needs more energy for a reason. So every single day in that, in those six to eight days before your period, your body is burning anywhere from 100 to 300 calories more a day. And like I said, the studies show no fat gain during that time. So there's a reason why you're craving more food. And there's also a very good reason why you probably should eat more food during that time. So I thought that was an interesting study. And, you know, you probably heard about this kind of thing before, but I thought it was interesting to share some of the actual research behind it and report the actual numbers in that energy expenditure during the luteal phase and, you know, some of the effects that we experience in our menstrual cycle. And it's very, very interesting. And the studies that showed no fat increase, they measured body fat uh, on the participants. So they were really able to determine for sure that no fat gain occurred. So it's kind of cool to see some of that supported in the research and, you know, they actually stated no differences in body fat, um, were noted across the participants. So that was the first study, just a little one there that I wanted to share. The other one is significantly more controversial <laughs> and is talking about fasting and muscle loss. So I share a lot of studies and research because I feel empowered since I went back to school that I learned 
biochemistry and physiology, but I also learned how to analyze and understand studies and research. And I like to use my voice and the platform of this podcast or Instagram or wherever it is that I can have, you know, some kind of voice or influence to be able to extrapolate some of the key ideas in the research. Now, we all know that research can be biased, that research can be set up on purpose to determine favorable incomes, uh, outcomes, <laughs> depending on who is sponsoring the study. I've participated in studies myself before, and I can say that, you know, as a participant, sometimes you can be biased as well. Like, I know there are so many flaws in research. That's why I really like looking at reviews and meta analyses because they will take many, many studies and put them together and review the outcomes and then determine what the research is saying from looking at meta analysis of dozens of studies together. And that really can pull out and extrapolate some really interesting conclusions. But I also share studies just because I find them interesting. I don't think that they're always conclusive, and that really applies here with regards to this last study that I shared this week, which is about muscle loss in fasting. And it's very controversial because there are some very big proponents of fasting who believe this, what this study is saying. There are also a lot of people who caution the public against fasting out of fears of muscle loss. And From all the people that I've interviewed, I'll say that some of the protein scientists that I had on the show um, that we all love and respect in the community, a lot of them had the same opinion that fasting for people over age 40 is not a great idea because it is harder to put on new muscle after that time and that has to do with differences in hormone levels. And so that is kind of maybe the one caution that I heard from those scientists that I think really makes sense. It's probably not a great idea to do a ton of fasting over 40 for that reason, because it can be catabolic of muscle. I'll tell you what this study said, and I'll tell you what my conclusions were from it, and also what I believe overall. And... I'll say I do believe that some muscle loss does happen during extended fasting, but there's a couple of caveats there. One is that it depends on how much body fat the person has. If a person has a lot of body fat, I think less catabolism of muscle happens. Obviously, if someone doesn't have much body fat, there's going to be significant breakdown of muscle. That's just common sense. I also think that in extended fasting of five to seven days, say done three, four times a year, there's not that much muscle loss. And actually the study here that I'm going to talk about explain exactly how much muscle loss there is, but also that we have to acknowledge that muscle loss happens. Actually, muscle loss happens every time you go into ketogenesis because there's a process known as pre- proteolysis, which happens, and it is muscle loss. Every time you go into ketogenesis or into ketosis, you do catabolize some muscle. It's just a part of the process. You can find it in any biochemistry textbook. Proteolysis happens during ketosis. So people who criticize fasting because of muscle loss have to know that muscle loss also happens when you go into ketogenesis and ketosis. And then you have to look at the fact that protein in most cases is moderated, but some people do keto with like no protein at all, like next to no protein. And there also is muscle loss associated with that. There's also a lot of muscle loss associated with very, very low protein diets like vegan diets, which I was on for many years, vegetarian diets. There's lots of different ways that there can be muscle loss through diet. On this podcast, we talk a lot about optimizing our bodies for wellness and along with that goes balancing our hormones. There are so many different hormones that play in our body and one of the most important ones is cortisol. Now, one of the things that I recently learned is how much the impact of artificial light 
plays on our hormones and can create disruption in our hormones. It can create too much cortisol in our bodies if we are getting too much artificial light coming in through our screens, which a lot of us, much like myself, are on for a large part of the day. I recently learned about this amazing company called Blue Blocks. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X. Blue Blocks have three types of lenses that offer complete light protection from day to night. Evidence-based, really stylish looking products that actually improve our lives. They launched three signature glasses. They have Sleep Plus, Summer Glow, and Blue Light, and they also have a Remedy Sleep Mask. I recently had the opportunity to interview their founder, Andy Mant, on the show, and we had such a fascinating discussion about circadian rhythms, about hormonal balance and function, and how getting a lot of exposure to blue light can really disrupt our hormones by generating too much cortisol, which can lead to higher blood glucose, poorer sleep, not getting all that restorative deep sleep and repair that happens at night because we're not getting enough melatonin. I really love using their glasses. I've started using them in the evening when I'm working late and it really makes a huge difference. Plus the glasses are really, really stylish looking and chic. You gotta go check them out. They offer non-prescription, prescription and reader's glasses and you can even send them your own favorite frames to have their world-class lenses installed into them. Now what's really, really cool too is that every pair of glasses that Blue Block sells They will donate a pair of reading glasses to the charity Restoring Vision. Now, Andy is generously offering 15% off to listeners of Fast Keto. If you go to blueblocks.com and use the code FASTKETO, that link is blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Go check them out. Let me know if you try them, and I would love to hear your results. Another thing that I know from studying autophagy is that the body actually recycles two to 300 grams of protein per day. So if someone is doing an extended fast, they're also getting recycled proteins in a huge amount. Two to 300 grams of protein per day are the numbers that were estimated by Yoshinori Usumi, who won the Nobel Prize for his research on autophagy. And he studied protein turnover And our cells do protein protein turnover daily, but it is accelerated during autophagy. And it really, there's so much protein recycling that happens at the cellular level that even if there isn't as much protein coming into the diet, a lot of protein is recycled. So in a state of fasting, even if there is some energy coming from muscle breakdown, There's also a lot of protein turnover that's happening. And in that autophagy, the body is discarding misfolded proteins and proteins that are folded incorrectly during the, um, during RNA transcription. And uh, there's actually an error rate. It's very small, but there is an error rate to our protein production. And when our body prints new proteins, which is doing constantly, it does have some of those proteins are misfolded in that process. And that's why autophagy is important because we want to sort of take out the trash and do our recycling just like we do at home. And we do that at the cellular level. So autophagy recycles cellular debris, misfolded proteins, breaks them back down into individual amino acids and reassembles them. So all of this is in autophagy. So the study that I posted this week talked about how, what are the the main sources for glucose when we're in a fasted state? And it's actually a mice study. So that's another thing that we have to take into account. It's not a human study. Mice and humans are not the same. But I do think that the logic that applies here is really the logic that I always defer to when I contemplate the idea of fasting, you know, if someone is overweight and they're doing fasting to burn body fat and get rid of, you know, some of the toxic, maybe oils, fats that the body has stored 
DNA damage and, and other mutagens, bacteria, all of that is removed in autophagy during fasting or exercise. But there is a glucose source and the body actually can make new glucose from the fatty acids because fatty acids have a glycerol backbone. And so we do see gluconeogenesis that happens in both short and prolonged fasting. But the key point is what is the main substrate for that gluconeogenesis? So what is the body using to make new glucose? And a lot of people say it's often muscle that the body is just going to break down muscle if you're doing fasting because in a fasting period or extended fasting, you need to make glucose. But when you think about it, every fatty acid that we have is a triglyceride. So it's three fatty acids that have a glycerol backbone. And this study showed that during fasting, the study evaluated mice that were done that had six, 12 and 18 hour fasting, which for humans works out to much longer than that. So more like several days. And the glucose was actually made from three different sources, lactate, glycerol, and amino acids. And the glycerol is the one that was the predominant source for new glucose. So especially the longer the fast went on, the more glucose was made from glycerol from our fatty acids. So I thought this study was really cool for a couple of reasons. The first is that it showed that even in the six-hour fast, the shortest fast, that glucose was still coming from glycerol. So basically, anytime you're doing a fast, even if it's intermittent fasting, like I do 16-8 every day, in that 16 hours, glucose is being made from lactate, it's being made from amino acids, it's being made from glycogen, which is the stored glucose that we have stored in our liver and muscles. And it is also coming from the glycerol backbone from our fatty acids, which is so cool. So in the six hour, the shortest one, 52% of glucose was being made from glycogen, which is the stored glucose in our muscle and liver, which makes sense. 27% was coming from glycerol from our fatty acids. And then 21% was coming from lactate. And then as the fast lengthened, the numbers sort of went down at first, but then they go way up towards the 18 mark. The predominant source of energy in the longest fast at 18 hours, 49% is coming from our fatty acids from glycerol. 27%, the second highest, is from glycogen, any glycogen that's left over in muscles and liver. 22% is coming from lactate, and only 2% is coming from amino acids. So in the longer fast, you get 2% that's coming from amino acids that may potentiate some amino acid loss or muscle loss. But those amino acids can be replenished by eating a lot of protein after the fast. So I just thought this study was so interesting because it just makes sense. If humans, you know, prehistorically humans and just historically didn't always have constant access to food. And if humans went for a long time being fasted, which anyone has done fasting knows once you've you know, gotten used to fasting, you've done it a bit, it's actually not that hard to do. And once the body becomes fat adapted, you don't really experience much hunger. You're able to just complete the fast. And more than anything, the biggest struggle is just being bored because you're not eating. Um, but hunger definitely isn't a factor if you're doing a five or seven day fast after the first few days. And if you're fat adapted or in ketosis, you probably don't have much hunger even on the first couple of days if you're fasting. So, you know, it wouldn't make sense if any time humans went out, went without food for a long time, that our body would just start eating all the muscle that we have when there is tons of 
fat and glycerol to be made into glucose available. You know, it, it, it would, you know, Dr. Jason Fung always makes this analogy of like, you have a, a wood fire at your cabin or something and you run out of wood. Are you going to, you know, chop up your couch and <laughs> start burning your couch? Or are you going to go outside and get logs from your deep stored fat? In this case, you know, the logs that you've stored under the cabin. Um, you know, are you going to start burning your own house? It's the same thing with a car. Like if you run out of gas, you know, the car, would it make sense for a car to just to start burning up all the metal or would it make more sense to go to a deeper source of fuel that it has? And that's what our fat is. You know, it, it's just like in a car, it's hydrocarbons. Fat is hydrocarbons. Lipids are hydrocarbons. And it's our deep storage that we have for cases or periods of time when we would go without food. So it just makes sense logically that the body would utilize what it has in storage just like when you run out of food in your fridge, you go into the freezer, you go down into the basement, you take the food out of the deep freeze or out of your freezer because you don't have anything available in your fridge. And the fridge really is like our muscle and liver storage of glycogen, what we have immediately available. But, you know, even in a shorter, the shortest fast that they did here, a lot of energy was still coming from stored fat from glycerol was being converted into glucose, although the majority was coming from glycogen and some from lactate. But as long, as soon as the study, the fasting, the fast went the longest, you know, the glucose all coming from that glycerol backbone that we have in our stored fat. And I just think it's so important because fasting is a really powerful tool. You know, I like to do a quarterly fast of five to seven days. Whenever the seasons change, it's just a great reset. It's great to get all that autophagy. It's not that difficult to do. It just takes some mental fortitude. You know, to me, it's a mental thing more than anything. Um, but after the first couple of days, you really, you feel so mentally clear. You have tons of energy. You're not really dealing with hunger. You know, as long as you keep yourself busy, you start getting all this energy to do tasks that you weren't wanting to do before, like cleaning out, you know, uh, your closets and that kind of thing. And um, it can also be a very spiritual time, a very therapeutic practice. And I don't like the flack that fasting gets that, oh, it's automatically going to be so catabolic to your muscle and break it down. You know, there are arguments made for growth hormone being anti-catabolic and ketones also being muscle sparing. And I, I definitely believe that. And I think that as long as your body has fat stores, it will tap into that before just eating up all your muscle. Unless it's something that is persistent and ongoing and excessive. And if a person doesn't really have much body fat, then I would naturally assume that the body's got to get glucose from somewhere and if there isn't any stored fat to get it from, it's going to have to get it more from muscle. So that's pretty obvious. That's pretty clear. But I just thought it was an interesting study. And I think that, um, you know, it, it just makes sense. It's just logical that the body would make new glucose from the glycerol that is stored with our fatty acids in our fat. And that it also showed that we get that fat burning, our bodies are always burning fat when we are not eating. So even in a 12 to 16 hour fast, intermittent fasting, your body is taking energy and making glucose. It's gluconeogenesis happening all the time. And people are so terrified of gluconeogenesis in the keto community. And they always think it's such a bad thing, but no matter what you're doing, your body is always making new glucose for you. <laughs> Um, it, it doesn't matter. It's just either getting it from your glycogen, your fridge, your readily, easily accessible storage of glucose in your muscles and liver, or if you don't have as much glycogen stored there, if you're doing a more strict, like zero carb approach and you don't have any carbs in your diet or many carbs at all, and you do more of a ketogenic approach, you're going to be getting more glucose and making glucose more from 
your stored fat and it's going to be coming less from glycogen. And I think that's why that we see that keto is a fasting mimicking diet. When we look at some of the pathways that it activates, they're very similar to extended fasting. And it's something that I've spoken about for years, talking to people about how they don't need to do so much fasting because keto and just being in ketosis mimics fasting and it's a fasting mimetic which is so powerful so i thought it was a great couple of studies uh the first one you probably already knew about the second one i know is controversial and i definitely got comments from people sharing studies about nitrogen loss but i've also seen and heard from you know doctors who are very familiar and with fasting and have used it therapeutically with their clients that those amino acids which here accounted for only two percent um and i've seen charts showing that proteolysis that happens initially that breakdown of protein um really goes down and the fat the energy that's coming from fat really ramps up the longer the fast is so you know i've seen all of these doctors talk about how those amino acids can be replenished as long as you really nourish your body well when you're not fasting. So I don't recommend like overdoing the fasting. Um, but I think it's a, it's a powerful tool that can be used in situations where people have a lot of excess body fat. You know, they're very obese and they want to bring that, you know, fat down and they enjoy fasting or they like it. But I know it can be addictive for people and, you know, I, I do caution people not to overdo it and make sure that you're teaching yourself how to eat healthy long term and how to make sure that you have a strong metabolism. Fasting can boost metabolic rate, but I think when it's done excessively, people tend to see negative results because over time, eventually it does slow the metabolism because our bodies are always adapting to whatever we do long term. So anything, if you do fasting for too long, eventually it will slow the metabolism and probably catabolism or breakdown of muscle will happen. So some interesting research. I wanted to share it with you guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoyed the Ask Me Anything episode that I did earlier this week. My carnivore meal plans are finally out. And I launched them last weekend. So if you're waiting to get them, I hope you got to check them out. Really excited for them to be out. And I'm working on a new book and new meal plans I'm really excited about as well. Can't wait to share more of that with you guys and a couple of really exciting projects that I'm working on now. So I'm excited to share all of that with you guys in the coming months. I hope that you've been having a great week so far. I hope I was able to keep you company and share some interesting science with you today. And I really appreciate you guys. If you know someone who you think might enjoy this episode, be sure to share it with them. You can go and check out all of the meal plans that I have at ketogenicgirl.com. They all come with my support and coaching in our members Facebook group. And I would love to see you there. So until the next episode, I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening and wishing you a fat field rest of your day. Bye for now. A few disclaimers. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice as I am not a qualified healthcare provider. The information presented on this podcast is for educational purposes only. Ketogenic Girl is not qualified to provide medical advice. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to this podcast. Prior to beginning a ketogenic diet, you should undergo a full health screening with your physician to confirm that a keto diet is suitable for you and to rule out any conditions or contraindications that may pose risks or that are incompatible with a ketogenic diet. A keto diet may or may not be appropriate for you if you have any kind of health condition, whether known to you or unknown, so you must consult your physician to find this out. Anyone under the age of 18 should consult with their physician and their parents or legal guardians.